Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual book talk with Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster about his new book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. Before we hear from General McMaster, I want to tell you about two online programs we will be presenting in commemoration of Veterans Day. On Tuesday, November 10th at 3 p.m., David Winkler, who is the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum Charles Lindbergh Fellow in Aerospace History, will discuss his recent book, Tribute to a Generation, Hayden Williams and the Building of the World War II Memorial. Then on Thursday, November 12th at 5 p.m., we'll present a special screening of the 1944 short documentary, Memphis Bell, the story of a flying fortress created by the U.S. Army Air Force under the direction of William Wyler. The footage of this version of the film was restored for the 75th anniversary of the bomber's 25th mission. Following the screening, Daniel Rooney, supervisory archivist of the National Archives Special Media Archive Services Division, will moderate a discussion with Catherine Weiler, daughter of William Weiler, and filmmaker Eric Nelson, who created the documentary The Cold Blue, using outtakes and footage from the Memphis Bell production and restored in partnership with the National Archives. You can view both of these programs on the National Archives YouTube channel. H.R. McMaster is the Thaud and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1984, served as an Army officer for 34 years, and retired as a Lieutenant General in 2018. He remained on active duty while serving as National Security Advisor in 2017-2018. McMaster taught history at West Point and holds a PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Joining General McMaster in conversation is Nicholson Coddington, the supervisor of the National Archives Education and Public Programs. He is a published author with a research focus in education at museums, libraries, historic sites, and archives. Before turning to teaching, Nick served for over 20 years as a cavalry and intelligence officer in the U.S. Army, leading humanitarian operations in the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. Coddington graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point and holds master's degrees in engineering, strategic intelligence, philosophy, and education. His PhD in social science education from Columbia University focused on teacher education. Now let's hear from General McMaster and Nick Coddington. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, and, and Nick, it's a pleasure to be with you, and thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, before we get to our questions, I do want to remind the audience that General McMaster is going to take questions at the end, so write them in the chat box of the YouTube, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. HR, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the, of the end of World War II, and as we were then, we are faced with the same two adversaries, China and Russia. What did we learn from that 75 years, and how does that take us into the future? Well, thanks, Nick. What a pleasure it is to be with you. I think, I think what we learned first and foremost is that there is no arc of history that guarantees the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems. That if we are to prevail, if we are to secure our freedom, our, and, and if we are to secure peace and, and, and prosperity for generations to come, we have to compete effectively. And I think, Nick, and as I write about in, in Battlegrounds, that in the 1990s, we became complacent, right? We were flushed with these twin victories over the Soviet Union in the Cold War, over Saddam's army, the fourth largest army in, in the world, and a lopsided military victory in, in the Gulf War. And, and I think we, we, we had reason to be optimistic, but that, over, that, that optimism became over-optimism and led to complacency. And, and the belief in these assumptions, one already mentioned, that, that, that our, the primacy of our free and open societies was guaranteed, but a second and related assumption that great power rivalry was a relic of, of the past. Uh, and then a third assumption that our technological military prowess guaranteed our, our security well into the future. And of course, that was all set up. It was a setup for uh, strategic shocks and, and difficulties encountered uh, in the 2000s. Uh, foremost among them, the most devastating terrorist attack in history that took the lives of 
nearly 3,000 innocents on September 11th, 2001. Uh, and then and then the unanticipated length and difficulty of the wars in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, we, we often we often want to debate, should we have done it in connection with the invasion of Iraq in 2003? I think what we ought to debate is who the heck thought it was would be easy and why did they think it would be easy? And then and then and then, of course, the, the financial crisis as well in 2008, 2009. And then our confidence was shaken. And I think it was in that period of time that uh, that the emotional impetus behind our foreign policy shifted, you know, from over optimism to pessimism and from maybe a, a tendency to undervalue and underappreciate the risks and costs of action to a tendency to undervalue the risks and costs of, of inaction or disengagement. And so what Battlegrounds is, it's an, it's an argument for the kind of sustained approach to foreign policy that we saw, uh, at, uh, based on your analogy, really after the, you know, after World War II and a recognition uh, that we were in a competition. And I think we have been in a competition for a number of years now, but we just vacated a lot of those critical arenas of, of competition. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise that, that when we're losing or when the balance is shifting against the United States, um, because we, we haven't been engaged effectively. Right. Um, part of that engagement and part of our strategy during the Cold War was containment, specifically a ring of containment, NATO, CETO, CENTO. Like, how important are alliances now in the 21st century, and which ones would you either improve upon or eliminate? Yeah. Well, I, th I think, Nick, they're more important than ever. And I think the reason why they're more important is we are in a real competition between closed authoritarian systems and, and our free and open societies. On, on the one side, you have China and Russia with, with different objectives and, and actually uh, pursuing much different strategies against us. But the, none of the problems that we're facing, whether it is the, the revisionist powers on the Eurasian landmass of China and Russia or the hostile states of uh, of North Korea uh, and and Iran, uh, or the, the problem of jihadist terrorist organizations, uh, or for that matter, about you know biomedical emergencies like a pandemic. None of these problems can be solved unilaterally. They all require a high degree of international cooperation because these problems move across borders and and, and affect all of us across the free world. So the the argument is to strengthen our alliances by adapting them to purpose. NATO, I think, is, is, is extremely important right, right now as, you know, as, as Russia is infiltrating troops in, in, into Belarus, but of course, as you know, has threatened uh, for many years that the Baltic states, beginning in 2007 with the denial of service attacks there, Russia has uh, in 2008, and then certainly in 2013, uh, changed the, the, the geographic borders in, in Europe by force for the first time since, since World War II. So it's important to deter conflict, and the, re the only way to deter conflict is to convince your enemy or, or potential enemy, that they can't accomplish their objectives through the use of force. But why NATO has to be adapted beyond that, beyond deterring uh, a conventional conflict or the unthinkable nuclear war, is, 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 to, is to be able to cope with what I describe in Battlegrounds as Russian new generation warfare. And this is the, the, the Russians' ability, uh, their effort, their strategy to meet their objectives, to accomplish their objectives below the threshold of what might elicit a military response, and it is it is a strategy, you know, an approach large, largely based on on disruption to disrupt us uh, with, with a range of, of, of activities, offensive cyber activities, cyber enabled information warfare, uh, and and to use this disinformation, so it's disruption disinformation, uh, to to polarize our societies, to pit us against each other, to reduce our confidence in our alliances, and then also the confidence in who we are as a people and, and in our democratic principles and institutions and processes to drag us down under the theory that Russia can be the last man standing. So, I mean, if, if we're to, if we're to counter uh, this, this uh, pernicious form of aggression effectively, it's going to take a multinational uh, approach. China uh, is promoting its authoritarian mercantilist model. And if it succeeds, our world will be less free, less prosperous and less safe. And because China is using a, a strategy, again, alliteration, Nick, if you'll bear with me on that, of, of, of co-option, co coercion, and concealment to create servile relationships across the Indo-Pacific that will allow them to achieve primacy in that region, exclude the United States, uh, and then and to compete with the United States and, and other free and open societies globally, that takes that takes that takes a concerted effort because China will play us off against each other. 
the U.S., Japan, the EU, the world's biggest economies, must work together to counter Chinese economic aggression, for example. Right. Let's, I will get to China in a second, but let's stick with Russia for a minute. You use a concept in your book, strategic narcissism. I was wondering if you could define that for the audience and then give us an example of how it applies to Russia. Your know, strategic narcissism is this tendency to define the world only in relation to us, right? Well, that's, that's a problem, right, because it's self-referential. Uh, but it's, it's a problem be, because we don't acknowledge oftentimes the degree to which the other adversaries, enemies, rivals, uh, the, 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 you know, the, we don't recognize the, the degree to which they exercise authorship over the future. And, 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 and we also underestimate the degree to which they, they're driven by interests quite different than ours, but especially emotions and, and aspirations and ideologies different from ours. And I think an example of this strategic narcissism is the, is the tendency to define the world and Russia's role in the world as we would like it to be. And the story that I tell in Battlegrounds is of three administrations, going back to President George W. Bush, who labored under the illusion that Vladimir Putin could become, you know, like the Grinch on Christmas Eve, right? That if we if we welcomed him back into the international community, his heart would grow two sizes bigger. He would realize his Russia's future really does lie with the, the West. He would give all the presents back to Whoville and stop this 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 campaign of of disruption, disinformation, and denial. George H. W. Bush remember said, "Hey, I looked into his soul." Well, you know, Putin is the best liar maybe in the world, and then and then President Obama, not to be outdone in this area. You know, I guess Hillary, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to carry a reset button uh, to, to Geneva and present it to, to Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov in a failed effort to reset the relationship. President Obama also remember, he leans over to Medvedev, who was who was keeping the seat warm for Putin at the time, and says, hey, we'll have some more flexibility after the election. He trades off uh, missile defenses in Poland in the hope that, hope that, well, maybe Russia really will be our friend, you know, but it didn't happen. And then President Trump labors under that same illusion when he says, you know, wouldn't it be a good thing if we had a, good, a better relationship with Russia? Yes, it would be a good thing, but it's not going to happen under Vladimir Putin. And the reason is Putin is driven by a sense of honor loss at, at, the, at the end of the, the Cold War. And he's driven by an associated desire, obsession to restore Russia to national greatness. And he's informed by, you know, by, by the reality that Russia can't compete with us on their own terms. Their economy is the size of Italy's, you know, and and uh, and, and so th- again, his you know his his strategy of choice is to to drag us all down. Right. Uh, you know, one thing, one story you tell in the book is the uh, the parable, the Russian parable of the farmer and the two cows. And I wonder if you could just retell that briefly, and then give an example of that on how their strategic you know plan is against the United States, and how does that come to fruition. Yeah, I, I borrowed this from my, my colleague here at Stuver, at, uh, at Stanford, uh, uh, Catherine Stoner, and and uh, and essentially the you know the story is that there, there's a Russian peasant who's who's jealous of his his neighbor because his neighbor has two cows and and he only has one, and a genie appears before him and says, "Hey, you can have anything you want," and and his reply is, "Kill my neighbor's cow." So I think this is really the mentality that Putin brings to, to, to this competition, right? He wants to kill our cow rather than to try to provide Russians uh, with, 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 greater, uh, with greater prosperity and so forth. He's, you know, he, he's, he's done it to himself. You know, he's built uh, a corrupt, a corrupt uh, government, a government in which he's at the top of really a protection racket. He has he has dirt on everybody, right? And so his utility is he keeps the oligarchs and the, and you know the corrupt the corrupt ones you know from killing each other and preserves the corrupt system that they all profit from. And so they have an interest to keep him in power. He has an interest of staying in power because he gets a cut of the action as well. And he can't really it's not clear how he's going to be able to collect on this after he retires. He's now extended his rule till twenty thirty six with a rewrite uh, of the constitution. And so Putin is you know Putin is is determined. To stay in power, uh, he hasn't set a positive agenda. His economy is stagnating, you know, because of sanctions to a certain extent, but because of the corruption in the system, and and because of lack of diversity uh, in the in the economy. Now add COVID, right, and a very poor response on COVID. Moscow's hit, getting hit very hard right now. So is St. Petersburg. It's not being reported, uh, but but they're in in very bad shape in terms of the effect it's having on the economy as well. Let alone a health sector that's not up to it. And then the collapse of oil prices, right? So, so you know, why does he poison Navalny? 
he's, he's probably in a, and it feels like he's in a pretty desperate situation in terms of the potential for growing internal opposition to him. And this is, of course, is what he's feared for some time is a color revolution like those that, 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 that occurred uh, in, in, uh, in Ukraine uh, and in others of the former Warsaw Pact and, and former provinces of the Soviet Union. He, he fears that that's going to happen in, in Russia as well. And of course, earlier this year, I think your viewers probably uh, heard the reports of the, of the protests in the eastern part of the country. In the end of last year, when, when Putin rigged the municipal elections, there, 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 was a, there were large protests and they arrested thousands of people, um, uh, killed many people. So I, I think that you know, the, the situation in Russia is tenuous. Uh, uh, I think Putin is, is feeling a, a bit desperate these days. Right. One of the few facts you gave in the uh, in your book was how 96 percent of the videos on Facebook and other social media by Russia focused on Black Lives Matter and police police brutality. And that is the you know, the misinformation that they're giving. I'm wondering, though, as we see through the years, the past 15 years, um, the invasion of South Ossetia, the invasion of root chain, shooting down an airline or over over the Ukraine, uh, the wantless disregard for life in Syria. You know, where's the big hotspot now? Do you see Russia trying to control power within Eastern Europe? And is that a threat to the United States? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I, I think that you have to watch wherever you have to be careful about wherever you're not looking. Right. So so we know that, you know, that the Baltics uh, were, were under duress, right, beginning with these 2007 denial of service attacks. But those but those are just part of a, a much larger campaign. Remember, it was all about the moving of a statue. Right. That was that was celebrating you know, the the uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Russian soldiers uh, who, who had occupied the Baltic states and denied them their freedom. So so I, I think that that we, we did a good job, I think, of bolstering uh, deterrence uh, in, in the Baltic states. But Russia is very active in the Balkans now uh, as, as, as well. And what you're seeing is is what is what he did to us is what he's trying to do in Europe. Right. Which is polarize those societies as, as, I, as I write in the book. The vast majority of Russian, Russia's campaign of cyber-enabled information warfare was aimed at issues of race, to divide us in issues of race. Well, you know what's interesting about that is that's what the KGB was trying to do as early as the 1920s and into the 1930s. But now, of course, they have new mechanisms to do that. Social media, uh, the most prominent among them. And, and, uh, and, and so this is the same approach in Europe. So what is Russia doing? Russia is, is creating... Uh, helping to create a humanitarian catastrophe in the Middle East. They are enabling the Assad regimes and, and Iran's um, serial episodes and mass homicide in Syria, which have, have caused a massive refugee crisis. That massive refugee crisis Russia uses in Europe to increase support for nativist parties that are opposed to, to migration and, 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 and to, to, to split Europeans on this issue. To split to to to, to uh, influence splits between countries in the east and uh, and and those in, in in northern Europe, and then to split polities societies within within these countries, and and uh, and to gain traction that way. So I, he's been masterful at this. There's, you can get a lot done if you're unscrupulous, right? Uh, and uh, and and I think that we have to really be cognizant of of the fact that he's trying to drag us down, and that's the first step is to is to expose it. I mentioned. You know, this, these are campaigns of disruption, disinformation, and denial. Uh, the, 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 what, what Putin banks on is it being able to get away with to get away with literally murder, right? And and um, and so I think it's really important for 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 all leaders across the free world to call out his behavior and pull the curtain back on it. Excellent. Let's move on to China for a moment. Um, one of your assessments in your book is that China views it as a narrow window in order to create strategic change and. So I'm wondering, what do you think the pandemic, what effect is the pandemic having on China? And is it actually shifting that power base between us and them? Right. Well, I, you know, Nick, I, I think that I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has catalyzed the competition uh, with, with China because China did see this, this as a fleeting window of opportunity to take center stage in the world, right? To, to grow their economy out of the middle income trap, to become the world's leader in, in advanced manufacturing, to become self-sufficient, not reliant on Western technologies, you know, you know like, uh, like computer, like uh, chips, microchips. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then also, you know, the, to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to, to, uh, 
to reassert itself uh, uh, nationally, to take you know to take center stage in, in, in the world. And I think because of the effect that COVID nineteen has had on on economic growth, uh, the party feels like it has to move now. You know, it has to take advantage of what it sees maybe as this fleeting window of opportunity now associated with China having foisted the virus on the world uh, to be able to come out of this crisis first. And so what's the evidence for that? I think it's pretty apparent, Nick. I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is a pattern that we ought to not miss. So it is the wolf warrior diplomacy uh, oriented on, on, the, on the West. It, there are mass, the massive cyber attacks that were launched on our medical research facilities in the midst of a pandemic. Talk about adding insult to injury. Then, then the, the massive attacks on Australia, uh, for, for, for Australian leaders having the temerity to suggest maybe an inquiry into how the heck this, this virus became a pandemic. Uh, then you have the bludgeoning of soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier, the national security law, and the extension of the party's brutal repression uh, into Hong Kong. Xi Jinping's speech just a week ago saying, hey, these concentration camps, they're great. The Uyghurs love them. I'm, you know, I'm going to put some, so, some annexes on. To, to, to do more re-education and really what is a campaign of cultural genocide there. You know, Nick, um, Uyghur birth rates are down 60%, right? And then, and then you have more aggression in the South China Sea during the pandemic, ramming Malaysian and Vietnamese vessels, uh, you know, and, and an effort to affect the, the largest land grab in history, the threats to tor- Taiwan, Japan. Okay, I could go on about this, right? So I think yeah, there, there's clear evidence that China's becoming much, much more aggressive. And, and what this requires is a concerted response from the free world. This is not a U.S.-China problem. This is not Xi Jinping acting out because Donald Trump is so mean and used tariffs against them. This is Xi Jinping acting on his own volition and, and trying to export his authoritarian mercantilist model in a way that that would be damaging to our long-term interests. Right. One interesting part of your book was about the infiltration into American universities, Harvard being one of them, um, and in the industry. And I'm wondering, given the pandemic and the immense financial strain on universities now, are you concerned that universities throughout the United States might be susceptible to Chinese um, inroads? You know, I, I'm, I, am, I am concerned about it. But you know what, Nick? I would recommend something that's counterintuitive. I would say, hey, bring more Chinese students here, right? Don't put all of them in engineering departments or nuclear engineering departments or, or electrical engineering departments uh, and, and, and computer sciences. But, you know, allow them to come here. Allow the FBI to do their job from a counterintelligence perspective. Make sure universities do due diligence and keep PLA scientists, People's Liberation Army scientists, out of our research facilities. We just did a report here at the Hoover Institution in the in uh, the, the China Chinese China Global Sharp Power Initiative about the infiltration of these uh, of these research activities, much of which are government funded, and we have PLA PLA scientists in there. That doesn't make sense. But I think we ought to endeavor to give Chinese students and more of them a very positive experience. We ought to we ought to ask university presidents to ensure that happens in two ways. First of all, integrate them into campus life. You know, some universities, they look at this as just a big, a big tuition payment. Right. And and so a lot of Chinese students are kind of warehoused in Chinese dorms and they go to to Chinese dining halls. That's crazy. Right. They should be integrated into the student body. The second thing is we should protect them from the coercive power of the Chinese Communist Party. And we should collect on and dismantle organizations that are designed to coerce Chinese students in the United States. This is the Chinese Students and Scholars Association. Uh, This is, in part, a problem with these Confucius Institutes. And certainly, it's the the Ministry of State Security uh, uh, declared and undeclared intelligence officers that operate out of consulates and run informant networks such that if a Chinese student says, hey, yeah, this repression of, of freedom, you know, it's not a good thing. Maybe maybe the Chinese people ought to have a say in how they're governed. If they utter this in a class, their parents get a knock on the door back in China. We can't allow that to happen. So I think we ought to do some things that are counterintuitive, right, and and uh, and bring more Chinese students to, to the United States, make sure they have a good experience, and protect them from the party's coercive power. Right. I want to go back to something you said a minute ago, and you touched on Chinese aggression in the South China Sea, and I was wondering if you could explain to the audience about the island building, basically, that's going on in that region, the land grab that they're doing, and why is that important to Americans 
And what should we do about it vis-a-vis -vis alliances and creating new ones? Yeah, tr trillions of dollars of trade flow through the South China Sea. One third of, of the world's surface trade, you know, go, goes global trade go, goes through the South China Sea. And you know, China wants to own the ocean. <laughs> hey, no, we we should, should send a simple message to them. Hey, nobody owns the ocean, right? And and what they want to do is own the ocean so they can coerce us and coerce the co the countries uh, across the Indo-Pacific region and in Southeast Asia in in, in particular, and and um, and create kind of a new tributary system. Uh, consistent with the, the old Chinese empires, where all roads lead to Beijing, uh, and and Beijing wants to to force these countries to conform to their foreign policy and to recognize to, to recognize their primacy in the region. They want to do that in a way that excludes the United States. They want to do that in a way that, after excluding the United States, allows them to isolate their their main regional rival, which is Japan, uh, and to intimidate any countries that have the temerity to challenge them. India and others among them. So it's, it's very important for all of us to take a stand. We're doing that. You know, we've done it uh, with, with these freedom of navigation exercises that are multinational. Uh, India, Australia, France, Britain, Japan have all joined in, in, the, in, these, in the free movement through the South China Sea. It's very important not to recognize this land grab. And there, of course, has been a, 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 a international legal judgment against, uh, against China in this matter as well, which they ignored and then coerced the Philippines to say, yeah, it's, it's fine with us anyway, uh, in exchange for you know, a big check uh, written to, uh, uh, to Mr. Duterte in, 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 uh, in, in the Philippines. So, so I, I think that it, it, there, there are many examples of this campaign of, of, of intimidation. I think it's really important to, to, to pay attention to what, uh, my old interlocutor, Yang Jinshu, said uh, when he went to a conference uh, of Asian countries under ASEAN uh, in, in 2015. And he said, you know, we're a big country and you're a little country. Get used to it. So, so I, I think that, that it's really clear that we are not asking countries in the region to pick between Washington and Beijing. We're asking them to pick between sovereignty and servitude. Right. And, and that's that's the choice that that uh, that these countries are presented with now. Right. Since the Nixon administration, we've been on a slow road to engagement. You offer a different uh, a different vision of that, that of competition and how we need to switch from engagement to competition. Please explain. Well, you know, our, our policy toward China initially uh, in the, the Chinese Communist Party uh, after the opening to China, engineered by President Nixon and and, uh, and Dr. Kissinger, uh, it, that was all happened in the context of the Cold War. And the idea then was was called triangular diplomacy, diplomacy, in which we would have a closer relationship each with with the Soviet Union and with China that, than they had with one another. Well, I mean, the, the, the conditions fundamentally change now. And then after, the, of course, the, the end of the, the Cold War, uh, that was no longer relevant. After the end of the, of the Cold War and, and under Deng Xiaoping, China began to open up and began to prosper as, as a result of opening up. It's pretty easy, right, to, to, to put up some pretty staggering economic growth numbers after the utter failures of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, right? I mean, so China grew at, at, at a fast pace. Uh, the Chinese people accomplished great things, lift, lifted you know, hundreds of millions of people out, out, out of poverty, right? Uh, but, but, of course, there was you know, a little setback there uh, in, in the, in the, in the uh, Tiananmen Square massacre, but we let China off the hook after that, because it, this is when in the 1990s we began to really make this assumption about a new world order. Right. There would be a new world order after the end of the Cold War. And in that new world order, in that new world order, uh, that, that there would be a condominium of nations who would work cooperatively. And, and China, as, as it was welcomed into the international community, would play by the rules, would liberalize its economy. And as it prospered, it would liberalize its form of gover government. Hey, that, that didn't happen, right? And I think it was clear by the early 2000s that that wasn't going to happen. And we clung to that hope for too long. We clung to that hope as, as President Bill Clinton worked very hard to get China's admission into the World Trade Organization, and which, by the way, they never met their promises, never played by the rules. Remember Ross Perot when, when, uh, when NAFTA uh, was first, was first uh, signed? He called it the great sucking sound you know, of, of jobs you know, into, into Mexico. Hey, there was a great sucking sound, but the sucking sound was to China uh, after they were given most favored nation status in the 90s and then, and then given admission to the, to the World Trade Organization. And, and uh, 
And so we, we, we should have known better by 2017 for sure. Uh, I, as I came in as National Security Advisor, I think we did implement the, the most significant shift in U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War, a shift away from this, this approach of cooperation and engagement based on the assumption that China would, would liberalize uh, to, to the recognition we had to compete with China, which was a rival power, a, a country that was, you know, that was promoting uh, a system uh, at, at our own expense. Right? And, and so I think... Uh, you know, I, I think that's a multi-generational shift in policy. It's going to be, it already is bipartisan. Uh, I just hope that that, that uh, if there is a change in administrations, that a new administration doesn't buy in to, to Chinese false promises of progress and then, and then, th- then let up on, on the competition. And, you know, I think these false promises will be along the lines of North Korea. Hey, we can, we can help you. Let's work together on North Korea. Well, you know, if China wanted to solve the North Korea problem, it could do it like right now. You know, in terms of, of denuclearization, uh, if you could, to put the appropriate pressure on Kim Jong Un, ninety-five percent or so of the of the, tra- of the trade uh, flows across Chinese borders uh, between China and, and North Korea, uh, or the false promise of uh, of helping on on carbon emissions and, and and climate change and environmental issues, which would be false promises as well. Xi Jinping, remember, just gave this big speech saying China is going to be carbon neutral by twenty sixty or something. It's a lie. China, I mean, the party is the party is building 70 coal fired plants a year. It just finished one in Kenya, which is the biggest carbon emitter in the country, right next to, right next to a UNESCO World Heritage Site. How's that, you know, for uh, for for the sensitivity of the of the Chinese Communist Party? So I, I think we have to call them on it. We mentioned the South China Sea. China is is destroying whole ecosystems in the South China Sea. Where where are the fleet of Greenpeace boats? You know, that assaulting uh, th- those islands. I mean, I-, I think that there ought to be outrage about cultural genocide, about this, you know, th- this this fundamentally irresponsible behavior that is inflicting so much harm around the world. Yeah, we could stay on China all night, but we need to move on to Afghanistan, the Middle East. Um, in your book, you are, you give an assessment of the U.S. and its coalition partners they have not been fighting a twenty-year war, but rather a one-year war twenty times over. Um, this past summer, our West Point classmate, Rod Lurie, uh, came up with a really grippy movie called The Outpost about the Battle of Kamdesh. And while Americans came away from that with, a, I think, a profound sense of respect and awe of the American soldier, I think they were, they might have been a little bit, well, they don't know if they can support what's going on there. And I'm wondering, how do we justify that in, in simple cavalry terms? Why aren't we just going to pop smoke and pull out of the battle position? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Nick, I mean, this is a this is a failure of leadership uh, across multiple administrations. And I think the true test of strategy, if, since you brought up The Outpost, which is also a, a great book by Jake Tapper, I, I really am a huge fan of the book. Uh, it's unique in that it tells the story of a place, uh, but but of different units in that place over time. Right. And and uh, anyway, it's just it's just a, it's a well it's a well done book. But I, I, I think that the true test of strategy is can you, as a platoon leader, explain to, to, the, to the men and women in your platoon how the risks that they're going to take on a mission, how the sacrifices they may be called on to make are contributing to an outcome worthy of those risks and worthy of those sacrifices? I think for too long in Afghanistan, we, we couldn't do that because of these strategies were, were actually based on fantasy, based on, on fantasy uh, of not really uh, fighting the enemy that was there. But by conjuring up, this is a great case of strategic narcissism, I mean, a, a prototypical case, uh, conjuring up the enemy we would prefer, right? And this is what the Trump administration has done uh, in, 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 in just the last year and a half. Uh, it's what the Obama administration did. In fact, I think paradoxically, you know, the, the Trump administration, after having corrected fundamental flaws in the approach toward, toward Afghanistan and South Asia, because this problem set really has, has roots in Pakistan as well, uh, and putting in place for the first time a sustainable approach to, to, the, to the problem in, in Afghanistan uh, that, that was fundamentally sound, the administration backed off of it and not only replicated the same flaws of the Obama approach, but exceeded them by really partnering with the Taliban and making concessions that box the Afghan government in and give the Taliban a, a position of advantage in the, in the Afghan negotiations. And, and, uh, and so you ask, you know, what is, what is at stake? You know, I, I think this is what the American people need to know. What is at stake? And what is a strategy that will deliver an outcome consistent with our security and our vital interests at an acceptable cost? What 
American leader has, has done that on Afghanistan. I would say President Trump did in an August 2017 speech, which is worth looking up. But sadly, he, he backed he backed away from that because there have been people in his ear who, who prioritized withdrawal as an end in and of itself, right? But the overall point is wars don't end when one side leaves. We are, we're, we're going back to the point of 1998. Remember, Al-Qaeda declared war on us. We thought, oh, who's Al-Qaeda? Osama bin Laden, who's that guy? Then there was a World Trade Center bombing. The, the first one in 1994. Then we're like, oh, gosh, you know, that was that we dodged a bullet there, but, you know, we weren't too concerned about it. Then there were attacks uh, against worship in, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and then on our embassies in, in, in 1998, what did we do? We fired a few cruise missiles in Afghanistan and called it a day. What happened next? 9-11. And so this is not a theoretical case. So we are there. What is at stake is to ensure that jihadist terrorist organizations don't control territory, populations, resources, aren't able to portray themselves as victors, so they draw more impressionable young people to this to, the, to this warped, perverted criminal cause, and don't again uh, threaten us uh, with, with mass murder attacks. That's that's what's at stake, and and of course these are groups that could gain access to the to the lucrative drug trade. Why is there a Taliban offensive right now going on in Helmand? Hey, that's where the poppies are, right? And once they control those poppies, that's billions of dollars of revenue. And so the stakes are high. And what is the strategy that can deliver an outcome? Hey, I think the narrative was wrong in Afghanistan. What if the narrative was, hey, we already won? You know, Afghanistan doesn't need to be Denmark, Nick. You know, it just needs to be Afghanistan. And so, you know, there, maybe it will always be a violent place. But you know what? The Afghan government was in control of the vast majority of the territory and all the population centers. And even though we had 10 of our courageous, selfless soldiers make the ultimate sacrifice in Afghanistan this year, 30 Afghan soldiers and police die every day fighting to preserve the freedoms that they've enjoyed since we kicked the Taliban out of Kabul uh, in 2001. I think that's worth getting behind. And it's, I would call it kind of a form of an insurance policy. But I don't think who's talked to Americans about that lately? Nobody has. So I don't, I don't believe that public opinion public support, popular will uh, for efforts overseas it, it are, 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 are immutable, right? Leaders can have can make a difference. And I just don't think we've had leadership like that, you know, at, at the most senior levels of our government. Right. Um, one key strategic alliance in the area is Turkey. And you describe in your book how the relationship with Turkey has gone south in the past few years. And given its geopolitical and strategic location, you know, how important is Turkey and how do we recover from that? I think it's really important. Uh, I, I don't know if we can recover, uh, you know, uh, this this really shift in, in the geostrategic environment. I think the biggest shift since the end of the Cold War and the shift that's against us. Um, I think this is this is clearly the result of the rise of the AKP. This is this is President Erdogan's party and his very deliberate consolidation of, of power in the country and control over the institutions in the country. Not just the military, but the judiciary, the police force, education, universities, schools across the country. And the AKP, his party, is driven by a kind of an Islamist ideology. This is He's a Naqshbandi Sufist, uh, which means Sufi. Uh, which, which uh, you know, main, Sufis usually, I mean, I love Sufis, right? I mean, they're fun to be around. They don't take themselves too seriously. It's a, it's a very moderate form of Islam. Uh, but but Naqshbandi Sufism is more like Salafi jihadism. And and um, and, there, and and the AKP is a big supporter of Muslim Brotherhood movements across the region. They've teamed with Gutter on this, and and sadly, what I think what is most significant here is that the AKP has control has control of the media, one of the institutions it controls, and now it feeds its people a steady diet of anti-Westernism and and, and anti-Americanism. And you know, I, I would have I would have really candid conversations with my counterparts there. Um, uh, Dr. Pollan, uh, you know, who's the, who's the spokesman and the national security advisor. And I would say, hey, let's just take an inventory uh, of countries who, over a period of time, fed their populations anti-American propaganda. You know, where And where are they now, right? This is not good for Turkey. And and uh, and I think what you see with with Turkey is, 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 is really a destructive policy by Erdogan to move away from the NATO alliance, to move away from Europe, to move away from the United States, and to try to position itself, not just geographically as it is positioned, 
but to position itself in the middle so it can play both sides off one another, both sides being you know, Iran and Russia on the one hand and, 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 and Europe and, and, um, and, and the United States on the other. It's not working out well for him because what's happened now is he's involved uh, in, in really warfare uh, with Russian proxies, Assad's forces and, and Iranian forces in Idlib province in Syria. He's involved against Russian supported forces in Libya. He's involved against Russian supported forces in the Goral Karabakh. So I think it's time for a conversation. Hey, how's this working out for you again? You know, as you're buying S-400 missiles from, from Russia and as we're shutting down any defense cooperation, we're moving uh, manufacturing uh, uh, components of the F-35 out of your country. It's not working out for you. And by the way, talk about hanging yourself. 80% of Turkey's trade is with Europe. And I'll tell you, I mean, you know, uh, the, this, the, the failure of Erdogan to condemn the beheading of the, of the teacher in, in, uh, uh, in, in France, uh, I mean, that really, you know, that, that really set off uh, uh, President Macron. And I didn't even mention Turkey's aggression in, in the eastern Mediterranean, where they're trying to intimidate an, a fellow NATO uh, ally, Greece, uh, and, 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 and prompted uh, France to deploy warships in support of Greece against Turkey. So what's going on? I just think it's time to have a conversation. But also in the meantime, we need to start working around the AKP. The AKP is also not monolithic, and it is probably likely to fragment in a post Erdogan period. So we ought to be cultivating positive relationships. I think there is still you know, a streak of Kemalism left uh, in in in, uh, in Turkey. Kemalism, remember, is is Westernism, secularism, and nationalism. Uh, what Erdogan has done is is, is taken a warped form of jingoistic nationalism and, and and combined it with an Islamist uh, kind of approach. That is anti-Western, sadly. So, hey, we have work to do on it. Uh, I think that I think that you know the, the Turkish people can't help but conclude that what what their leadership is doing is against their interests. I hope just hope they don't learn it the hard way. Right. Uh, before we get to our uh, our viewer questions, I just had one last really uh, one comment I would like to get from you, and that is um, what I really enjoyed about the book is that was it gave pragmatic solutions to solving some of these problems. But most interesting, especially as an educator, was the importance you place on civic education. And I was wondering if you could talk about that and how that is a road in order to make our country a more perfect union. Well, Nick, th thanks a lot. I mean, all, the book is you know, really about these themes of strategic narcissism and strategic empathy. It, it, is, it is largely about try, trying to understand how, how the recent past produced the present as the first step of making a projection into the future. So I, I really emphasize the need to, to, to read and think and under, try to understand history and the complex causality of events historically. Uh, and, and I do, I, I relate all of this to strategic competence, to improving our strategic competence. But, but then it, you know, it, it occurred to me as I was researching and writing and thinking and discussing the topics in, in the book that we also need confidence. We need to restore our confidence in our ability to implement a long-term approach to foreign policy, but also confidence in who we are as Americans, in our identity as Americans, confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. And I think as we've witnessed in 2020, uh, the, these triple crises of a pandemic, a recession, social and racial divisions laid bare by George Floyd's murder and the, and, and the, and the protests and the civil unrest and violence that followed and you know, I, I, and the vitriolic partisan environment that we're in, you know, as we speak right now, uh, in connection with the presidential election, I think it's easy to be pessimistic. But I think what we should turn that around. We should we should focus on, I think, an effort to restore pride. And I quote Richard Rorty in in the conclusion. And and what Rorty said is, he said that that national pride is to nations what self respect is to individuals, a, a necessary condition. For self improvement, and and so I, I think that we can get this through civic education. You know, one of the things that really bothers me these days, Nick, is kind of like the end of em our ability to empathize with one another, and and how how identity politics is interacting with bigotry and, and racism and creating the, these centripetal forces that are spinning us apart from one another. I think that it's our history that can bring us together. I think we should be able to all celebrate. The radical idea of the American Revolution, that sovereignty lies neither with king nor parliament, but with the people. We should recognize the great gift 
that we have a say in how we're, we're governed. And we, should, and we should recognize the revolution as an achievement. We should also, though, recognize the disappointment associated with the revolution's inability to remove the biggest blight on our history, which was the institution of slavery. We could then again, Nick, celebrate that we emancipated four million fellow Americans after our most destructive war in history. We can again acknowledge the disappointment of the failure of Reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow and the Ku Klux Klan, the separate but equal period, but then again celebrate the achievements of the Civil Rights Movement and the dismantlement of de jure uh, 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 segregation and inequality of opportunity, while still recognizing, Nick, that there is inequality of opportunity in our country, that we, that, that we need to address education in particular. Where you're born, the zip code in which you're born, should not limit your ability to participate in the American dream. We have work to do, but you know what? Our founders knew that. Our founders said that our republic must be constantly nurtured. That's true today, as it was in the 18th century. So I think that we do need a concerted effort to restore pride, to do so through civic education. And I think it will help us get beyond the vitriol. I mean, I think when you learn about, hey, you know, our founders were concerned about factions. You know, that's what they called political parties back then. And they thought that they were a grave danger to our republic because of the way that those parties would, would pull us apart from one another. They had in mind the bloody wars uh, 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 in England in the 17th century. Our founders knew it would be very dangerous to try to pull the military into partisan politics. George Washington's grandparents fled the English Civil War. And so there's, there's a lot of wisdom you know, in our founding. There's a lot of wisdom in our, in our, in our Federalist uh, papers. Uh, Madison and, and Hamilton wrote extensively about the danger of factions, for example. So I think in, in instilling a sense of history and, and, and our shared American experience will help us transcend identity politics, will help us transcend bigotry, to restore our confidence in, in who we are as Americans. And, 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 and I think we need a concerted effort to do so. Thank you so much. Um, so let's get to some questions now. Uh, the first one, conflict between nation comes down to competition for resources. I find it surprising that we don't also focus on India or Brazil. Why has there been no attention dealing with these nations? Yeah, I think there, there has been a significant amount of, of attention uh, on, on Brazil and India. You're, you're right. These are Im immensely important uh, countries. Uh, I write about India in Battlegrounds and the need for, I think, the whole free world to help India succeed, right? Because a, a small problem in India is, affects the world because that's going to be large in scale, right? And India is, is, a, is the largest democracy. You know, it's kind of an ugly democracy sometimes. Sometimes you wonder, like, how the heck does this work? But it does work. And, and India is, is, a, is a country of great opportunity, but also very significant problems. Uh, I think in particular the interconnected problems of, uh, of an energy, climate, environment, food security, water security, and health security. I think that we, that whatever administration comes in in January ought to put together a major partnership initiative with China, with I mean, no, sorry, not with China, with India, obviously, uh, but and to bring in Japan and the European Union and others uh, to to work with with India to 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 help India succeed. You know, I, I really you know have a soft spot in my in my heart for you know Prime Minister Modi and those around him. I got to know him fairly well uh, in, in the time that I was in Washington. Uh, Mr. Do Doval, who's his national security advisor, uh, Minister Jay Shankar, who's, who's back as uh, leading the foreign affairs effort. These are really wonderful people. But I think we need to have some frank conversations about the danger of Hindu nationalism and the importance of, of really not stoking you know, sectarian animosity uh, in a country that, in, in which that could be devastating. So, I mean, I, I think India, tremendous opportunities, tremendous problems, but we ought to be, you're right, whoever wrote that question, I agree with you completely. And I think Brazil for the same reasons, because of the scale and the importance of, of Brazil to, to, uh, to, to the Western Hemisphere in particular. We've had a very good partnership with Brazil. Of course, Bolsonaro, you know, he's a, you know, he's, he is a, uh, I'll just put it, I'll just put it mildly, an unconventional figure, right? Uh, but, but I think there's a strong recognition that our interests are very closely aligned on issues like Venezuela, you know, for example, on issues like. Argentina right now uh, that that are a source of, of uh, 
you know, of tension uh, in, in Chile, uh, a very successful economy, uh, but, but one in which uh, there, there is a, you know, there's inequality of opportunity and frustration over it. So, so I, I think that Brazil's been a very good partner. Um, you know, Mexico is a country to keep an eye on in, in our hemisphere. I mean, I, I worry about, about uh, President Lopez Obrador and his policies. Uh, I think in many ways he's kind of done the opposite of what's necessary to come out of the COVID uh, crisis. And of course, we want Mexico's recover, economy to recover, uh, so that so that Mexico can can do do a better job as well dealing with uh, uh, the criminal networks uh, that are inflicting so much harm on Mexico. Um, and we want our economies to be able to recover together across North America. So, so I, I you know, I, I didn't write enough about this in the book. I wrote a little bit about it. Uh, there's always so much I could take on at, at a time, you know. But but uh, India is is central to the uh, to the analysis in the book. Well, at 500 pages, it still is a an easy, a quick read. I, I have to say that. So the next question is, sir, do you think that NATO slash the UN needs to provide more guidance or update policy when it comes to cyber attacks and cyber warfare in general, specifically in relation to China and Russia? Absolutely, absolutely. And and I think uh, I think from a cyber defense perspective, with the acknowledgement that you can't have a cyber defense without a cyber offense, and then and then a recognition that we have to work together to harden our systems. Uh, when we work together, you know, we we can create redundancy. We can create systems that degrade gracefully rather than fail catastrophically. If you think about how cyberspace interacts with space, for example, and the need for maintaining access to satellites, if we have multinational satellite capacity that we that we're running with our partners, for example, you pose your adversary with a dilemma. Hey, do you want to go after a satellite? Which means, you know, if you, you take on the whole, you know, you take on on the on the whole alliance uh, or a number of countries simultaneously. Uh, that's one aspect of it, uh, but but I, I think that um, you know that that a, a strategy for coping with you know cyber, which is attacks on infrastructure, cyber enabled information warfare, uh, c- cyber crime uh, as well, uh, all aspects of, of offensive cyber operations and cyber espionage, uh, that it takes a multinational effort these days, as you know you know the electrons. You know, they move move through servers in all different countries. You know, they don't respect national boundaries either. So, so I think a a a, a uh, an approach uh, to to cyberspace, and then also an approach to to privacy uh, and and data uh, safeguards and data standards is going to be immensely important. Right now, what we see is is maybe four or five different internets you know cropping up now with different rules associated with them. The U.S., the EU. Japan, and if we can, India. I mean, if we, if and the UK now, outside of the EU, if we, if we can agree on those standards, we can ensure a fair, free, reciprocal environment and, and, and competitiveness. If China's allowed to do what it wants, and it just launched an initiative, right, uh, you know, data standards, you know, 2035, uh, that will put us in a position of disadvantage. Right. Uh, I want to respect your time tonight, so let's get one last question. Um, how long do you think... Or how long do you believe we can exist at a level of competition that is below the threshold of open conflict with Russia and China, especially as China and Russia achieve parity with us militarily? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's really dangerous, right? And so, you know, uh, Russia is, is not going to achieve parity with us militarily, but it has a very destructive nuclear arsenal, right? And you saw this irresponsible behavior on the part of Putin. Remember when he gave that speech, I think it was in April of 2017, when he showed in, in his speech... In, right. you know, Nuclear missiles descending on really mar a lago on Florida, right? You know, I mean, uh, I mean, talk talk about you know uh, brazen and 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 irresponsible, and then and then Russia announces this 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 doctrine. The doctrine is escalation domination, or escalate to de-escalate, where they they threaten they openly to incinerate European countries and then sue for peace on their terms uh, with the threat of hey America, do you want a nuclear holocaust in response? Right. Well. This is one of the reasons why we had to pull out of the INF treaty. I mean, uh, you know, if only one side is adhering to a treaty, it's it's a fantasy, right? It's not it's not a treaty, and so I, I think this has opened the door finally now, maybe hopefully to multilateral uh, arms control uh, negotiations, including the Chinese as well, and, and and cooperative efforts on nonproliferation. But you know, I think it's really what's really important to note is you know. Hey, I mean, non-proliferation agreements are not—they're not ends in of themselves, right? They have to actually have a positive security effect, and and uh, 
And so I, I think that with Russia, we, we ought to really try to communicate to Russia that they're not going to get away with this, that, they're, that their activities are irresponsible. You know, I, I tell the story in Battlegrounds of my meeting with my counterpart, Patrashev, in Geneva. Uh, we did a, 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 a confidential meeting in which, in, in which uh, uh, I tried to convey to him that, that this behavior is extremely dangerous, uh, and it is in both of our interests to prevent a conflict. And Russia should not continue to, to step up to this line because they're not going to be able to predict when they cross that line and when they elicit a response that leads to an escalation of conflict. I think that China is also uh, being extremely irresponsible now, especially vis-a-vis with Taiwan. The period of time to watch is between now and the next Communist Party Congress in 2022. This is when Xi Jinping, you know, he's promised, right? He's promised to, to make China whole again, right? And, and that, that includes Taiwan. And, and, uh, and we're seeing more and more aggressive approaches toward Taiwan. I think we're doing the right things by making the six assurances associated with the Taiwan Relations Act public. That, that was good. Um, and, then, and then also, I think the, some of the high-level visits, some of the multinational cooperation in, in trying to amplify Taiwan's voice in international fora, that's positive. And especially the arms sales to Taiwan is important. I think really what we need now more than ever, Nick, is th- these old-fashioned Thomas Schelling you know, uh, deterrence by denial. Right, the, the capabilities uh, with us and our allies and like-minded partners to really convince the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese Communist Party and to convince the Kremlin, hey, you can't accomplish your objectives through the use of force or through aggression that you think is going to allow you to accomplish your objectives below a threshold that might elicit a military response. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a great question uh, you know, that we should always be evaluating. What is our deterrent capability? Are we demonstrating? Not only the capability, but the will necessary to prevent what would be a catastrophic uh, conflict with either one of those countries. HR, it's truly been a pleasure. On behalf of the Archivist of the United States, I just want to thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. And we look forward to when this crazy pandemic is over and you can come back to the uh, the, the archives in D.C. and talk to us in person in the McGowan Theater. Hey, hey, thanks. I, I appreciate it. And, you know, Nick, if you allow me to do a shout out to the, to the West Point class in 1984 mm-hmm. and to do so in memory of a great American, Toby Green, who from our, we just lost from our class, who dedicated his whole professional career to service in our army and was a phenomenal officer and a phenomenal person. But hey, what, what a pleasure to be with you. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, Nick. And thanks to all the viewers for, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much.